So up next, I'm actually really excited for this talk. We've got uh, Julie Gunderson and uh, Mandy Walls, and obviously we're going to be talking about reducing the trauma in production with SLOs and chaos engineering. Uh, and so here we go, ladies. Hi, everybody. We are very excited to be here today. Um, I'm Julie Gunderson, a senior developer advocate at AWS. And I'm Mandy Walls, a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. And uh, yeah, we actually used to work together, and this is something that we're really passionate about. So I kind of want to start off with a little bit of a story. So by a show of hands, who here likes Lego? All right, that's great. So I have a little bit of a Lego problem. And Lego recently released the Lego DeLorean, or Time Machine. I don't think they're actually allowed to say DeLorean. And I was so excited for this that I waited until 10 o'clock at night by my computer because that was when it was coming out. And I got on there, and I was waiting and refreshing so that I could order it, and I found it, and I added it to my cart. And I was so excited, and I went to check out and my card got declined. Now, my bank that I bank with is pretty reliable in the fact that if it was a three-day weekend or a time change, my card would get declined. <laughs> yeah, super funny. So by the time I got through the fraud department, they said it wasn't fraud. By the time I looked at the mobile app and I couldn't log in and finally went to the actual website and looked at it and there was a little banner saying system maintenance, the DeLorean was on back order. Oh. Boo, oh, so sad. <laughs> but what we're talking about when we talk about SLOs, we're talking about your customer experience. Absolutely, we are after making things amazing for your users, whether they are internal to your organization, like they're just the folks on the next Zoom call, or they're actual paying customers out there in the world, what we want when we do our work is to make things excellent for them so they come back and they use our stuff more. So at PageRuty, we have this workflow process thing that we talk about called full service ownership, which is really about like having that full life cycle participation for our application development engineers. And when we get things into production, we want them to be great. But we know best laid plans when our software gets into production, who, who knows what's gonna happen? Like, users are weird. They're gonna do weird stuff. They're gonna use a part of your application that you were like, I don't know if people are gonna like this, and it turns out they love it, and you're like, what is even going on? And so when we think about what's going on in production and bad things that can happen, it's really a matter of when and not if. So we wanna be prepared. We wanna think ahead for what might happen. So we're gonna talk a little bit about SLAs, SLIs, and SLOs, and how they relate to chaos engineering. So we're gonna start and we're gonna wipe the slate clean about SLAs because there's lawyers involved there and we aren't lawyers, right? Like this legal agreement between you and your customers, there might be money changing hands, there's signatures and docu-signs and all this stuff going on. This is a screen cap of part of PagerDuty's SLA. You can find on our website if you're a PagerDuty user, that's our promise legally to our customers. And like, that's not the part that we're gonna worry about today. We're gonna talk about SLIs and SLOs, which is the parts we can work on and set for ourselves. So our indicators are our metrics, and our objectives are our goals for those metrics. And so when we look at our systems today, they are distributed. They are complex. We've got multiple components on different machines built by different teams with different goals. Implementation is varied. And as we know, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the death balls. I used to have a slide of them of what the architectures look like for Netflix or, or for Twitter, for AWS nowadays. These have grown in complexity which means that failures are going to happen potentially more often. And failures can lead to costly outages. And when we think about downtime, 
you know, a lot of people put that in terms of money because if you talk to your sales team, they're able to quantify that. But downtime actually costs more than money. You end up with frustrated customers who, I don't know, can't buy their Lego because let's just be real, that was really frustrating. And just to let you know, within uh, 15 minutes, I was able to finally change my bank. A bank that I had banked with for over 10 years. It took me 15 minutes to change it, all because I couldn't get my DeLorean. It was really traumatic. But there's more than that too, because then you end up with employees that are really burnt out because nobody wants to work at that place that's always on fire, right? So then you have people leave because they're sick of pager duty calling them at three, sorry Mandy, at three o'clock in the morning, they leave and then that puts more burden on the rest of the folks, which what does that do? It's this nasty spiral. But there's also the unquantifiable costs as well. You know, Twitter, ratings, Yelp, all of that, and again, People can go out and now change their bank in 15 minutes. So we want to think about what downtime actually means and how do we at least work to prevent that. Absolutely. So when we're talking about like how much time it takes to like blow your business out of the water, right? We also have this concept of what we call error budgets. Have anybody heard error budgets? Kind of a new term that's getting out there, right? So when we're thinking about how much good stuff we want to serve and how much bad stuff we can kind of get away with before people like leave and go to another bank. And that's our air budget. It's like what's left over after we've met our goals for how good we want to be. So I'm, I don't have a soapbox up here, but like uh, I started my, my job in telecom. So like five nines is like just forget you ever heard about this, right? Like, Five Nines was meant to be for copper telephone lines, hardwired from your house to the CO that's like less than two miles away. Like, if you are driving your operational teams to Five Nines, they hate you, I promise. <laughs> because now even in distributed systems, like it's very, very hard and almost impossible really to get there for this. If this is dial tone. This is dial tone, right? And like the internet doesn't work this way anymore. Packet switch networks are not circuit switch networks. So I'll hop off my soapbox and just say like, be nice to people and forget you ever heard about five nines. I mean, there is the concept of extreme reliability if we can divert for a moment, you know, where you're going for, for five nines, but you have to understand there's other dependencies. There's your customer's ISP, for example. There's other things that will contribute to that. So yes, please don't yeah. beat your team. Yeah, five there. minutes of downtime in a year, that's just abuse. But when we talk about that and when we talk about the goals for whatever nines it is that we want to achieve, there are ways that we can help get there by ideally preventing outages before they occur or preventing those incidents. And that's why I love to talk about chaos engineering um, because chaos engineering is experimenting on a system. It's one of those things that is unfortunately named because a lot of C-levels don't love like, oh, we're gonna inject chaos, we're gonna create some failure today. They kind of get a little frustrated. Yeah. But it's something that does follow the scientific method, right? What you're doing is you're experimenting on your system so that you can identify those failures before they become outages. And it's supposed to improve your reliability. And we want to uncover hidden issues. We're testing for things that we don't know about yet. And we can also expose blind spots in our monitoring, in our metrics. One thing that's not on here too is you're also building a culture within your teams of working together because you're building that culture where you're saying, you know, failure is a good thing because we learned from our system. We're not going to blame people, we're going to improve. And so when you look at chaos engineering, what we're really saying is, does this work the way I think it does? Do these SLOs that we've set, do they still make sense for us? Are our services, is our monitoring picking up on what we are measuring? Yeah, so <clears throat> all of this is about, as I mentioned at the very beginning, centering your user experience and the things that your users care about. And that might not be the things that you assumed from the very beginning were the things that they were going to care about. So you might oh. have to talk to the users. You might, and you might not, you, well, you're not looking at necessarily, you know, measuring your CPU usage. But when we look at Netflix, 
What do they measure? Stream starts per second, because what does that translate to? User happiness, right? So we are looking at the things that are important to our users. It's easy to get our CPU utilization and our memory utilization. And those things might be indicative of downstream issues that are going to impact the users. But like, my user is not going like, to dial up support and say, hey, man, your time to first byte slow. Right? Most of them are not going to do that unless they're like these people in the, in the audience yeah. calling up. Yeah, one of you did. One of you will. You right? know that, right? OK. <laughs> so, so you have to figure out like, what users care about. You can do this with your heat mapping and other testing and other things that you're working on or with your product managers. But it might be different for different parts of your application, especially if you're working with distributed systems and microservices environments. There might be different things that people care about for different slices of the experience. So we want to be flexible in the ways that we are capturing what our users love and what they don't love, right? So it might be no errors on the main page. It might be center module loads first. You can see some of this, right? When you are say, loading up YouTube. Julie loves YouTube. Like, we'll just you know, say that. But like, when you f fire up a YouTube page, the first thing that loads is that video, because they know that's the part you love, right? The playlist comes in later. The comments load in later. All the important stuff comes in first. So they've optimized for that user experience that you love. And then we turn that stuff into metrics. That's where the technical big brain human thinking comes in. You can say, all right, this is the part that we know what this experience looks like. Here's how we're going to translate that into our metrics and our dashboards and set our quantitative goals based on that. Now, sometimes when we talk about metrics, people get really scared because even the biggest, most advanced organizations, there are teams that just don't have metrics. And they're like, ah, no, we don't have those. We're not monitoring for certain things. What do we do? We're just going to hide our head in the sand. That doesn't actually work. But what you can do is you can start small. So you can start with some baseline metrics. And then what you want to do is you want to use chaos engineering to validate those. You want to validate that those objectives, that those indicators are working with your team. And you do that by proactively injecting failure into your systems. Now, I want to take a step back right now, and I want to point out, you don't necessarily want to do this against 100% of production the very first time you've done it. So we have a concept called the blast radius, where you want to start small, and then you increase your blast radius, and you move out through your environments when you're starting the practice of chaos engineering, because there's a lot of things that we don't know. And remember, a big part of this is learning. It's about developing those, those cultural relationships within the team, and it's about validating these things that we have set out. Absolutely. And we talk about doing them in production because that's where our users are going to meet the application for the first time. But it's absolutely fine to do chaos engineering in non-production environments as a test as well. Like you're looking for how does my thing behave when I black hole this back end and say, hey, man, you can't talk to that anymore. Like what happens? So you can work on your defensive programming practices and other user-focused things. So when we get to our production environment and we want to figure out are we making, meeting our goals, there's... There's some math, and like it looks pretty impressive there, but like honestly, the tools are gonna do a lot of this for you, right? But like, this is what it means, right? I have my service level indicator, right? And what that is, is the number of good things that happened divided by the total number of things that happened times 100, because it's a percentage, and that's how we talk to the people above us is in percentages, right? And then our error budget is whatever's left over, right? So if I want to say 95% of these things are good, then 5% of them are bad, and that's my error budget. So if we look at nice round numbers, because that makes the math easy to talk about, the, last, the yellow line there, if I have 100,000 events, maybe it's page views, maybe it's database queries, whatever it is, if I want 99% good, that's my SLI for right now, that means I need 99,000 of those that were OK. They were in my tolerance. If I have 1% for my error budget, that means I've got 1,000 that can kind of be out of the way. Like Maybe they're just too long, or maybe there was an error, or something timed out, or whatever. So I have a little bit of wiggle room to say, OK, 1,000 things went wrong. Now, 
when I'm looking at managing this thing in production, if it's 3 a.m. and I see one or two errors pop up, I've got a thousand that can be wrong before I've blasted my error budget. So you know what I don't have to do? Page anybody, right? Like I can wait. Maybe it was something transient. Maybe there were gremlins in the system, whatever it is. But like I can use that error budget to give my human beings some more sleep and a little bit of buffer before we have to like set our hair on fire and everybody gets on a Zoom call and freaks out for a while. So we can be a little bit more proactive and a little bit more mature about what we're doing with our errors when we have these kinds of statistics. So we've got three components. We set our experience-based indicators. Whatever it is, we translate it to. Time to first byte, query duration, page payload if you're working over slow things to remote ground stations or whatever you're doing. And then we use those SLIs to set our objectives with the math. And a lot of your tools are gonna do this for you. It's been uh, incorporated in a lot of really good tools uh, in the last couple of years. And then you set your time period, so you get to reset things and have a clean slate every once in a while, right? And maybe that depends on how often you're doing a release. Like, we wanna do a sprint for two weeks and we're gonna ship these features and we're gonna reset so that we know how the impact of the new features are and things like that. So you can actually like, give yourself a little bit of a break and clean everything up. But then, what happens if it's not right? What if you're constantly blowing through that error budget? Maybe it's bad. Maybe it's not a good goal for your team. Maybe it's not something that you can actually reach. And it's traumatizing to your operations teams if you're giving them goals they can't meet, right? So you want to sit down and actually think about it. These are internal tools. Remember, we talked at the beginning about SLAs. That's your public promise. These are your internal promises for your team and the things that you care about internally, right? So you can change them if they don't work for you. They're not meant to be part of your employee reviews. You didn't meet your SLIs, so you get demerits or whatever. And we can change them, we can adjust them. If we're blowing them out all the time, it's time to have a difficult conversation with the product manager and say, hey man, we can't ship any more features until we've improved our reliability and quit blowing out these error budgets so that you can actually bring that back into your full software development life cycle. And when we talk about those new features, you, know, you do want to test those out. You want to make sure that they are working for you and your team. And as Mandy said, that they're not blowing those, those SLOs out of the water. And you want to bring the rest of the folks into that conversation. So, you know, Mandy mentioned your, your product managers. You want to have them be part of these conversations because they need to understand if you're not meeting the customer expectations for the current features you have in place, Maybe you should wait. Because what was that first math that we saw? Who knew this was going to be a math conference? But, but what was that? 99% equals zero. So if your customers are unhappy with your product as is, if they can't use your features as is, do you think they're really going to care about that new feature? As a matter of fact, sometimes I get really irritated when I have something new, and I think it's because of what we do, right? We know what happens on the back end, but when you see something new, but the other stuff doesn't work. So you want to use chaos engineering to also test out those new features before they get released if you can. Yeah. You know, let's make sure that our, our product's still going to work. Let's going to make sure that these new features enhance it, and let's bring other folks into that conversation. And so there are a few ways to get started, and you've kind of heard me mention this before, but there was a time in the past when I used to talk about chaos engineering where I actually said, you're doing it wrong if you're not doing it in production. You're not practicing it if you're not practicing in production. And I was wrong, and I can admit that, because it's okay to embrace that failure. 
but you can actually start chaos engineering in development. You can, you can start in staging. You can move through the stages and you move into production. You want to get confident with this practice, especially if it's new for your organization, especially if you don't necessarily have those metrics set. Maybe you just don't have the right observability into place. You don't know what people like yet. Yeah, and it's okay because you start small. If you think about it, it's how we work with code, right? You move iteratively through the stages and you can do that with chaos engineering. And again, you start small and then you expand that blast radius out. Sometimes you might only start with one team, a team that's ready or maybe a non-critical component. Yeah, absolutely. You can also use chaos engineering to validate your dependencies, your downstream dependencies. You can actually use a, an experiment where you black hole, you cut off you know, all access to a service and you can see how that impacts your service because each team, they have different objectives that they're trying to hit, but, but how does Mandy's service impact my service? And I want to know that. And I can use chaos engineering to really validate that and then to have a conversation with Mandy. Absolutely, like dependency mapping is a big part of being ready to be into production in the first place. Like the success of my objectives on my application derive from what my backend dependencies are able to deliver to me. If those folks are internal, like Julie mentioned, we wanna have a conversation with the other teams in our organization to say, hey, what's your baseline? What can I expect from you so that I know what I can deliver to our users via the front door? And if you're back here always on fire, like I need to do a little bit more defensive coding around that dependency so that it's not blasting everything out of the water. The same if you've got external things, like knowing the, the vendor SLA, having that relationship with those vendors that are providing you a service. Maybe they're really bad and it's time to look for something else, right? Or you know, having some other failover, or thinking about protecting your user experience via those relationships, what those folks are able to provide, and then verifying them with the chaos engineering practices that you have. So let's talk a little bit about error budgets. I mentioned them earlier. This is what they kind of look like. More math. More math. More math. Well, it's sort of math. It's, nah, it's barely math. I mean, there's letters. <laughs> there's letters in it, so it looks suspiciously like algebra, but like whatever. So we mentioned before, it's what's left over. The wiggle room that I have that users are going to make, oh, it's fine. We know it's hard. And they're still going to keep coming back, right? They're not getting to the point where Julie's like, look, man, every time you have to change the time zone, things fall apart. Which, if you've been in the industry long enough, you know that there are several Java container servers that definitely used to do that and would just fall over. So we get to that level. We're like up to here with the errors. But like when we're down here with the errors, people are OK, and we can keep that as part of our error budget. Then we also have the idea of dealing with planned and unplanned work. And part of the things that we're going to use our chaos engineering for is making sure that when these things do happen, the unplanned things come through, that we're kind of ready for them. So we've got planned things, changes we know we're going to put into the system. We got new features to ship. We've got upgrades we have to do because part of it's still on like Red Hat 6 or whatever. And then we've got other updates that we have to put through. And those things are going to create churn on the environment. And we have to make sure everything's OK. But then we've got other incidents. Maybe there's an error or a bug in the application. Maybe we've got an upstream issue and we need to like take out some feature for a while while that other department deals with their, their issues. That all eats into our error budget. So that means I've got less and less space to play with things and to test things and to figure out with my chaos engineering what might be going wrong or what I can fix. Well, and as I mentioned earlier, a component of this is the cultural piece, right? And we can move through incidents faster if we have that muscle memory. If we've worked with the teams, if we understand how an incident operates. Who here has been on an incident call where everybody is talking over each other and kind of yelling? A little scary, right? But who here has been on an incident call with a commander who, where the call is running smoothly and people know what they're doing? Now, obviously, we know that the better experience is the completely chaotic one, right? Because, you know, it gets your blood pumping. I want everyone on the call. I want to make sure the CTO is, like, asking me personally what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, that's definitely... Well, I prefer good. it when they text you, too. That's, that's amazing. Out of band, totally. But when we look at, like, our recovery time, 
objectives, right? When we look at those things, that practice that we've had where we've run through these things, that cuts down on that time of that incident, right? That helps you stay within those error budgets because you can resolve things quicker. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, the other good thing we can do now is we can set alerts for our error budgets. And you can let PagerDuty know, you can let them, whatever, if you're using something else, whatever, okay, fine. But like, you can let the, your alerting system know, hey, you're in danger of blasting through this error budget. And you can also, like I mentioned earlier, suppress those things if you've still got some wiggle room and it's okay and it's 3 a.m., right? So you can notify when a service is approaching the limits of its error budget. I've had 560, 750 errors on this thing, and it's time to take a look at it, whatever. My notifications can go to my operations team. They should go to my product managers as well, because they should know that you know maybe the timelines for new features are in danger because we don't have the reliability that we want. And then exhaustion of the error budgets might be time for a more rigorous review. You can also make these part of your post-incident review, talking about, where is the error budget for this service that we just had an incident on now? Are we in danger of blasting through our current error budget? Have we totally blown through it and we are now in lockdown? So one thing we don't want to do is do some chaos engineering when we've already been making messes in production. Right? I mean, the whole goal, right, is to prevent those messes in production, but when they're there, let's just go ahead and hold off on running that experiment or making sure that you're running it in a very controlled way in a very small blast radius. So you do want to understand. Yeah, even if we're trying to like make things better via the chaos testing, our users don't know that. They yeah. just know that, hey, the thing is still flaky and they're going to be more unhappy with you. So making sure that we're still within their tolerance there. So looking at our life cycle for these kinds of practices, we're going to research our user behavior. So maybe we're gonna look at logs, maybe the product has a heat map for where people click and all that good stuff. We have some behavior that we've studied. And we're looking for where we need to up our reliability and our performance, and we're gonna test those things with our chaos engineering practice. We set our goals, we start with our initial SLIs and SLOs, and then we work to keep them green as long as we can, right? And we verify those in our post-incident reviews, when we have post-mortems, and we can adjust them to business requirements. And if things are blown out, we adjust the business requirements to keep our SLOs. So, yeah, in summary, user experience is why we're here, right? That is what we care about. Putting code into production and no one uses it, tree falls in the forest, who cares, right? So, we want the users to love our thing, and to do that, we have to be lovable, right? So we talk about our SLOs, we quantify what is good and what is not so good with the users in mind. Then our error budgets tell us how close we are to the edge and where we can do some experimentation and play around a little bit, and all that should feed back into our work prioritization so that if we're out of budget, Maybe we go into a freeze, right? That's totally possible. And then we change them when they don't work for us anymore. So we do have some great resources for you. So you can find some excellent talks at SLOConf. PagerDuty has an amazing podcast, Page It to the Limit. Uh, you can actually hear more about chaos engineering on an episode we did with Bruce Wong. That was actually a really fun one from Stitch Fix. Yeah, and there's an SLO one with Alex Hidalgo mm -hmm. um, that we put out a couple months ago. Shameless plug, Nathan was also on the podcast. Jason's going to be on next week, so you should totally subscribe. And you can check out Amazon's uh, Fault Injection Simulator. Um, there's also O'Reilly has a, a great book, and we have a PagerDuty trial. Yeah. Um, with that, I do want to show you this is the built DeLorean. Yeah. Yeah. I did get it. Had to go to Amsterdam, pick it up there, bring it back to the United States. But hey, I used a different bank. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.